fracking is a contentious subject for many environmentalists. There is a lot of debate about what the actual environmental impacts of fracking are and how they affect people living in the area. Honest Cheese is here to give you the lowdown on what the science actually says. We'll start with a brief history of fracking, and then talk about what the environmental risks really are according to science, and finish up with what regulations look like. Oil underground is stored in pockets of impermeable rock. A lot of times it hides in small crevices, not in one big reservoir. Fracking works by cracking the rocks to allow the oil hidden in the crevices to escape. The first attempts at fracking did this by literally blasting the rock apart. This is far from a recent development. It all started in 1866 when Edward Roberts, a Civil War veteran, got the idea to set a concentrated explosion inside of an oil well in Titusville, Pennsylvania to increase oil flow. They called the explosive device lowered into the well Roberts Torpedo, and it was indeed successful in increasing oil production. Over the next century, drilling operations experimented with different types of explosives and using an acid water mix, which ate away at the crevices in the rock, creating pathways to the main shaft of the well. It wasn't until the 1970s and 80s that George Mitchell of Mitchell Energy and Development started hydraulic fracking operations with horizontal well offshoots in the Barnett Shale in Texas. Hydraulic fracking adds sand, lubricants, and other chemicals to 3 to 7 million gallons of water and then blasts it into the borehole under great pressure. The pressure forces the ground to crack open and then the sand holds those cracks open in order for the oil or natural gas to escape. The water that was originally pumped down into the hole then flows back up and must be disposed of. This water contains the chemicals originally in the water solution as well as naturally occurring minerals and organic compounds which can be radioactive. In order to talk about the environmental and health risks associated with fracking, we need to talk a bit about the disposal of fracking waste, referred to as flowback. What chemicals exactly does the flowback contain? It's difficult to say precisely because fracking companies are not required to disclose the chemicals that they use, but this is what we do know. 73% of fracking compounds are hazardous chemicals, some of which can actually alter epigenetic pathways, so if they do come into contact with people, they could have negative effects for generations. Known chemicals include naphthalene, formaldehyde, and volatile organic compounds. There are three main ways flowback is disposed of, deep well injection, open air pits, and treatment or reuse. The cheapest option for fracking companies is deep well injection. Water is injected at high pressure into deep wells drilled in the ground, only in this case it's for storage rather than oil extraction. There were concerns about waste leaking from these wells into the water supply, and in the 1980s regulations were passed to limit the risk. However, the Halliburton loophole in 2005 reclassified all fracking waste as non-hazardous. Deep well injection is also associated with increased numbers of man-made or induced earthquakes. Open air pits are another option for disposing of the fluids. These are basically just big man-made ponds where the waste sits. The downside to this is that they are often unregulated and some of them don't even have linings to keep the contents from seeping into the ground. Some states have gone so far as to ban them completely. The most expensive option is treatment and reuse. Treating the water to the point that it can be reused for additional fracking purposes takes a lot of time, equipment, and money, but there are actually some advantages for fracking companies. As we have increasing water shortages, reusing the commodity can make some financial sense, and currently fracking waste that will be reused is not under regulation by the EPA, so it's slowly becoming a more popular option. There is growing evidence that fracking operations may be creating significant amounts of air pollution above EPA standards and producing methane gas, which is a big contributor to global warming. We know that there are higher levels of certain dangerous pollutants in the air above fracking areas because there have been aerial studies done which take samples of the air above areas where fracking is done. This is what they've found. A study found especially high methane levels above areas in Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, big centers of fracking activity. Methane gas has a global warming effect 28 to 34 times greater than carbon dioxide, so these fugitive emission rates above fracking areas are very troubling. Research has also found that there are higher levels of smog and toxic chemicals in the air around fracking sites. These can irritate the eyes, nose, and mouth, aggravate respiratory conditions, contribute to blood disorders, and immune
immune system diseases, harm developing fetuses, cause cancer, silicosis, and premature death. Here's the list of detected chemicals. Hydrocarbons, hydrogen sulfide, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylene, formaldehyde, silica sand, and ozone smog. The USGS only recently admitted that fracking causes earthquakes, and there is still a lot of documentation that says it creates a minimal risk. There is a definite connection between fault lines and oil. The faults create breaks and folds within the earth that trap oil and make it accessible. Areas such as Oklahoma have a lot of old and previously inactive fault lines. When the fracking liquids are injected at high pressures into the ground, it puts pressure on these fault lines and causes them to slip, creating earthquakes. And it's not just the deep well injection that causes earthquakes. Studies have shown that the act of fracking itself is also responsible. Buildings in areas where there are fracking earthquakes are more likely to be damaged because they weren't built with earthquake safety in mind. So now that we've covered drinking water contamination, air pollution, and earthquakes, let's talk a bit about what regulations cover fracking in the United States. We'll be looking at federal regulations. Different states may have regulations, such as those who have banned fracking or open air pits, but those laws vary significantly and are not always well enforced. The Clean Air Act of 1963 is a federal regulation that limits air pollution, but it treats each individual well as a pollutant source and does not take into account the aggregate impact that a large number of wells would have in a given area. And while pollution from one well may be minimal, pollution from hundreds of wells in a certain geographical area certainly isn't. The National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, NEPA for short, required federal agencies to assess the environmental impact of federal actions. The Clean Water Act of 1972 created limits for pollutants in surface waters, but fracking fluids are not classified as pollutants. The Resource Conservation and Recovery Act of 1976 created regulations on waste in order to protect the health of people and the environment. But in 1982, waste from oil fields was exempted from these regulations. In 2005, the Energy Policy Act removed NEPA's jurisdiction over oil and gas drilling, and the Safe Water Drinking Act was amended to exclude injection wells. So we used to have more regulations over the oil and gas industry, and fracking in particular, but over the past few decades, they have been removed one by one. We want to know what you think about fracking. Please let us know your thoughts in the comments. We also have a podcast that covers this subject in a bit more detail. If you are interested, you can find the link to that and our website in the description.